By the summer of 1944, the outlines of the final victory in the Pacific, have become visible. Marines, Navy and Army troops under Admiral Chester Nimitz's Pacific Fleet, had successfully island-hopped through Central Pacific, securing the Marianas in August, providing U.S. Air Force, with bases large enough to support the operations of the new B-29, long-range bomber, required for the bombing campaign against Japanese home islands. At the same time, forces under General Douglas MacArthur in the Southwest Pacific, had secured eastern New Guinea, western New Britain, and the Admiralty Islands. Both routes of advance, now approached the next major American objective of the Pacific Campaign, the Philippines. Both Central and Southwest Pacific routes, were under the direction of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, so as early as March 1944, the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff, acknowledged the reoccupation of the Philippines, as a crucial step, toward the final defeat of Japan. From there, the Allies could cut Japanese lines of communication to the rich, occupied territory of the Dutch East Indies, Indochina, Thailand, Burma, and Malaya. In the Philippines, the Allies could also establish bases, to support subsequent advances, against Taiwan, the China coast, or Japan itself. In July 1944, MacArthur and Nimitz, met with President Roosevelt in Pearl Harbor, to discuss strategy and plan further offensive actions against Japan. During that meeting, the Philippines were finally set as the next target of the Pacific Offensive, giving MacArthur a chance to fulfill his promise of, I shall return, made to the Filipinos when he had to leave, back in 1942. The strategy called for the approach to the Philippines from the south, by the forces of the Southwest Pacific Zone of Operation, supported by the U.S. Navy's Pacific Fleet. However, before any attack on the Philippines could commence, it was necessary to conduct preparatory actions. Therefore, according to a detailed strategic plan, MacArthur was to take the island of Moratai, southeast of the Philippines, to secure a much-needed foothold for a further advance, while Nimitz was to take the Palau's island chain, to protect MacArthur's right flank. Furthermore, the Navy was also supposed to occupy Ulithi Atoll, positioned halfway between the Mariana Islands and the Palau's. Both operations, were scheduled for September of 1944. Admiral Nimitz and Navy commanders, had their eyes on Palau's and Ulithi, even before Mariana's operation began. The Navy considered the occupation of these islands, necessary to complete the blockade of the Carolines, and to assure the neutralization of once formidable Japanese bases at Truk and Rabaul, by cutting them off from the only remaining supply route. Moreover, the Palau Islands were included as an objective in a strategic plan for the Pacific Offensive, prepared on March 12, 1944. In May, Nimitz issued an order for the invasion of the Palau Islands Group, outlined in the plan designated as Operation Stalemate. Operation Stalemate, was an ambitious plan, considerably bigger in scale than Mariana's offensive, with the goal of seizing the entire Palau group, rather than only a few selected islands within the archipelago, as had been the case in earlier operations. The islands of Palau, constitute the westernmost part of the Caroline Islands chain, and the archipelago contains more than 250 islands and islets, that vary from typical, flat coral atolls in the north, to the higher, more rugged volcanic islands in the central and southern Palau's. The largest, primarily a volcanic island, Babel Deob, dominates the archipelago. With a 363 square kilometers area, the island represents more than three-fourths of Palau's total land mass. The remaining area, is divided among three volcanic islands, two atolls, and numerous uplifted coralline limestone islands. For Palau's offensive, the Navy intended to assign five divisions, grouped into two corps, the 1st Marine and 81st Infantry Division of the 3rd Amphibious Corps, and the 7th and 77th Infantry Divisions of the 24th Army Corps, with the 27th Division in reserve. According to the plan, the 24th Army Corps, would assault the main island of Babel Deop, while simultaneously, the 3rd Amphibious Corps, was to assault the southern islands of Peleliu and Ongawa. 
The operation was scheduled to begin on September 8, 1944. However, due to stiff Japanese resistance on Saipan, and delays in landings on Guam, the plan was revised on July 7. With the bulk of the 3rd Amphibious Corps, including commanding staff, along with the 77th Infantry Division, committed to an invasion on Guam, and the 27th Infantry Division deployed on Saipan, the new revised plan, designated as Operation Stalemate II, was much more modest in scope. The landing on Babel Deop, an island far larger than Saipan or Guam, was abandoned in favor of focusing all the resources on the attack on the archipelago's two southernmost islands, Peleliu and Ongawa. The new plan, called for the 1st Marine Division to attack Peleliu, and the 81st Infantry Division, to land on Ongawa. The planners considered that seizing these two islands, would be sufficient to implement a blockade of Japanese garrisons on other islands within the archipelago, and support any future offensive actions. Given that the regular staff of the 3rd Amphibious Corps, was already committed to the fighting in Guam, the 1st Marine and 81st Infantry Divisions, as well as the planning group, had been detached from the 3rd Amphibious Corps, and assigned to the new provisional unit, designated as X-Ray Amphibious Corps, under the former commander of the 2nd Marine Division, Major General Julian C. Smith, until General Roy Geiger, the 3rd Amphibious Corps commander and his staff, returned from Guam to take command over the expeditionary force. The primary objective of the operation, Peleliu Island, is a raised platform Coraline Island, with an area of approximately 17 square kilometers, surrounded by a fringing reef up to 900 meters in width. On the island's low and flat southern end, the Japanese had built a hard-surfaced, X-shaped airfield, suitable for both bomber and fighter missions, with complete servicing facilities which could be operational, as soon as the island was in American hands. In addition, another airstrip was under construction on the adjacent island of Njizbus. In contrast to the relatively flat southern part, the island's northern end is more rugged, dominated by the 75-meter-high coral and limestone cave riddle hills, known as Amurbrigal Mountains, that narrow into separate Kamlianlul, and Amiangal Mountains, covered by dense tropical forests. The vegetation in this area was so dense, that U.S. intelligence officers, who reviewed air reconnaissance photos, had no idea of how heavy the terrain was beneath it. In addition to air reconnaissance, the island was the subject of extensive surveillance and scouting by submarines, and men of the underwater demolition teams. The intelligence gathered, revealed the absence of wide sand beaches suitable for landing operations. The two most appropriate beaches, located on the eastern side of the island, designated as Purple and Scarlet, were quickly ruled out, since they were the most heavily defended. Moreover, the close proximity of the dense mangrove swamp, would result in a shallow beachhead, that would ultimately cause congestion on the landing site, and the advance inland had to go through a narrow bottleneck, ideal for Japanese defense. Beach Amber, which spreads along the northwestern peninsula, had the worst terrain features. The coral reef in this area was the widest, and the higher ground, dominated the beach area. Besides, the northern flank of the assault force would be exposed, to flanking fire, from the nearby Njizbus island. Therefore, the finally prepared plan, called for the marines of the 1st Marine Division, veterans of battles at Guadalcanal, and Cape Gloucester on New Britain Island, under Major General William H. Rupertus, to land all three divisions' regiments abreast, on the two remaining beaches, designated as Orange and White. The 1st Marines, under Colonel Lewis Puller, were to land with the 2nd and 3rd Battalion on the left flank, on White Beach 1 and 2, while the 1st Battalion, would remain as a floating reserve. The mission of the 1st Marines, was to drive inland through the barracks area, to a predetermined point, and then will left, to attack the southwest end of Amurbrigal Mountains. Once the beachhead was secured, the 1st Marines, were to advance up the peninsula, to the island's northern tip. In the center, the 5th Marines, under Colonel Harold Harris, were to land in a similar formation on beaches Orange 1 and 2. 
The 1st Battalion on the left, would link up with the 1st Marines, while the 3rd was to drive straight across the airfield to Peleliu's eastern shore. The 2nd Battalion, was to come ashore one hour after the initial landing, to move in between the other two and attack across the lower end of the airfield. After securing their part of the beachhead, the 5th Marine's mission, was a seizure of the comparatively flat northeastern peninsula, and its outlying islands. On the right flank, the 7th Marines, under Colonel Herman Hanneken, were to come ashore on Orange 3 Beach in a column of battalions. Afterwards, their mission was to drive across the eastern coast, and then swing right to take the southern tip of the island. In the meantime, the two regiments of the Army's 81st Infantry Division, under Major General Paul J. Mueller, were to remain close to Peleliu on troop transport ships as a reserve. Their mission, the invasion of Ongawa, could only begin after it was assessed, that Peleliu was well within American hands. The D-Day, was set for September 15, 1944. The planners anticipated a heavy and hard-fought battle, that may result in a certain number of casualties, which, according to their assessment, would be over within one week. They partly drew their optimism, from experience from previous operations, and mainly because, after the fall of Saipan, the U.S. forces captured a significant amount of intelligence information, that revealed the true strength of Peleliu and Ongawa garrisons. They had no idea, however, that the Japanese concept of defense, had changed considerably. The largest single, Imperial Japanese Army unit in the Palau's sector, was the 14th Division, commanded by Lieutenant General Ino Sadao, with the bulk of it deployed on Babel Deob. Besides the 14th Division, the 53rd Independent Mixed Brigade, and the Navy's 45th Guard Force Unit, all part of the 31st Army, were also present in the area. The backbone of the force defending Peleliu, was the 2nd Infantry Regiment of the 14th Division, reinforced with one battalion from the 15th Infantry Regiment, and one from the 53rd Independent Mixed Brigade, along with the usual variety of small miscellaneous army and navy units, both combat and construction. The island's garrison, with an overall strength of about 11,000 men, was under Colonel Kunio Nakagawa, commanding officer of the 2nd Infantry Regiment, a skilled officer and, as would be proved later, an excellent defensive tactician. And although Major General Kenjiro Mirai, a deputy commander of the 14th Division, was also present on Peleliu, the interrogation of the few surviving Japanese prisoners of war, following the battle, indicated that Colonel Nakagawa, was an actual commander of all the units stationed on the island. The real reason why General Kenjiro Mirai, was on the island, and the exact role he played before and during the battle, remains unknown. For the defense of Peleliu, Colonel Nakagawa, had split the island into four defense sectors. The 346th Independent Infantry Battalion of the 53rd Independent Mixed Brigade, defended the northern part. Deployed in the south was the 3rd Battalion of the 15th Infantry Regiment. The two battalions of the 2nd Infantry Regiment, the 3rd and 2nd, defended the eastern and western sides of the island. The 1st Battalion of the 2nd Infantry Regiment, Engineer and the Tank Company, served as the mobile reserve. Although the deployment of troops, did not differ much from that on Saipan or Guam, Nakagawa nevertheless, prepared an unpleasant surprise for the incoming Americans, simply by following the orders. After the loss of the Marianas, the Imperial Japanese Army decided to abandon the old strategy, of trying to stop amphibious assault at the water's edge, and hold the Americans on the beaches, from the positions exposed to naval gunfire. Instead, they now preferred an in-depth defense, further inland, out of the sight of the heavy ships, attempting to bleed the invaders as heavily as possible, forcing them to fight for every meter of the ground in a war of attrition. Furthermore, the Japanese also abandoned the Banzai charge, assessing it as being both wasteful of men and ineffective. Nakagawa and his island garrison, would be the first to test this new tactic, although he did not completely abandon the defense at the water's edge, 
it only served to slow down the American advance, until the bulk of his forces could take the defensive positions more inland. The entire island, was full of reinforced concrete emplacements and bunkers. In addition, the Japanese had constructed an extensive tunnel network, with some of these multi-level tunnel systems, could shelter up to 1,000 troops. Most of all, Nakagawa, took full advantage of the heavy terrain features. A Murbrigal area, was a complex system of extremely rugged, raised coral and limestone hills and ridges, full of caves that provided excellent emplacements for cave and tunnel defenses. The Japanese turned this heavy terrain, into a line of fortifications in depth, and built concrete pillboxes and bunkers everywhere, providing interlocking fields of fire and mutual support. Virtually every cave, was turned into a strong point and often connected with others by tunnels. The combination of well-prepared defensive positions on a heavy terrain, and the persistence and determination of Japanese soldiers, will significantly disrupt American plans, and hopes for a quick victory. On September 12, the first U.S. Navy ships, of the Fire Support Group, appeared on the horizon in front of Peleliu. For the following three days, five battleships, five heavy and three light cruisers and fourteen destroyers, pounded the small island firing salvo after salvo from heavy guns. Shortly after, Navy planes from eleven escort carriers, began bombing and strafing, joining the ships in an effort to soften the Japanese defense. Covered by naval artillery, men of the Navy underwater demolition teams, began their dangerous task of clearing the beach obstacles, and blasting the way through a coral reef, sometimes under the Japanese fire. In the pre-dawn hours on September 15, 1944, Marines of the 1st Marine Division, began boarding the landing craft and Amtraks, hoping that this time, the naval shelling had done a proper job, and that when they reached landing beaches, an easy task would await them. As the H hour approached, the stage was set, for one of the hardest and most brutal battle, ever to be fought, in the Pacific theater.